Today is the Mass from the 6th Sunday after Epiphany on this 26th Sunday after, after Pentecost here in beautiful Calgary, Alberta. The Epistles from St. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. Brethren, we give thanks to God always for you all, making a remembrance of you in our prayers without ceasing, being mindful of the work of your faith and labor and charity, and of the enduring of the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ before God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved of God, your election. For our gospel has not been unto you in word only, but in power also, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much fullness, as you know what manner of men we have been among you for your sakes. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, receiving the word in much tribulation with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you were made a pattern to all that believed in Macedonia and in Achaia. For, for from you was spread abroad the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, your faith, which is towards God, is gone forth. So that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves relate of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who has delivered us from the wrath to come. The Holy Gospel. taken from St. Matthew chapter 13. At that time Jesus spoke to the multitudes this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which is the least indeed of all the seeds. But when it is grown up, it, gr it is greater than all the herbs, and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and dwell in the branches thereof. A mustard plant will, rise, will grow up to nine feet tall. Another parable he spoke to them, The kingdom of heaven is like to leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal. Unto the whole was leavened. All these things Jesus spoke in parables to the multitudes, and without parables he did not speak to them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things hidden from the foundation of the world. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. As a reminder, remember this is the month of November to, uh, to make an effort to visit the cemetery, to pray for the souls in purgatory, to visit there, and, and especially in this month. Also pray for the seminary in Kentucky. We have uh, eight seminarians who are one, one brother and seven seminarians studying. The Father Fiverr is working on the visas of some more uh, from, to come from Philippines, and possibly Nigeria. So do pray for that. And in the meantime, classes go on as usual. And the, the regular structure of the day, according to the rule of the seminary, written by Archbishop Lefebvre. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Lord says, The kingdom of heaven is like to leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, until the whole was leavened. Very simple, isn't it? Who's the woman? The woman is Mother Church. And who are the three measures of meal? It is the Holy Trinity. And, and knead into the soul, that is, into the, the mystical body of Christ. So that when you're baptized, the Blessed Trinity really dwells in your soul. And as some of the Benedictine great abbots have said many years ago, such as uh, Dom de Lot, that the Blessed Trinity actually makes, gives us already eternal life. We already possess eternal life by sanctifying grace. The only difference is we don't see the Blessed Trinity, but He dwells really within the soul. And this, so our whole spiritual life, our whole striving to get to heaven is, is more one of growing in union with the Blessed Trinity and doing everything out of love for God. Everything. And nothing is wasted. Nothing is, is to be thrown out. All your works, your recreation, your sleeping, your eating, 
You're changing diapers, you're mixing concrete, hammering nails, shoveling snow. Whatever you do, we do, uh, to do it, as St. Paul says, with the love of Christ. So, on this point, I'd like to cover with you from St. Thomas Aquinas. A very, remember St. Thomas Aquinas, the popes have said of him that he refutes every heresy. And Martin Luther, he tried to burn every single copy of the Summa of Theology he could get a hold of. He hated St. Thomas Aquinas, and all the heretics do. Because St. Thomas uh, so perfectly blends all truths in the Summa of Theology. So this, I'd like to cover with you, why did, Christ, why did God the Son become man, and not God the Father, or God the Holy Ghost? Could, Father, could God the Father have become man? And St. Thomas says, yes, it could have been the Father who became man. It could have been the Holy Ghost. So why did the Son? And there are three objections. The first one says, it should have been the Father who became man. Because if he did, there would not have been the confusion about the, the, with Arian heresy. So when, the, when God... The Son, when our Lord prays and says, The Father is greater than I. This objection says, well, there's some confusion. But then if the Father became flesh, it would not have been confusing. And of course, it's not confusing. We know the answer is the distinction between the divine and human nature in Christ. The, the, so, what does St. Thomas say? I'll read some of it. And uh, it is very beautiful. I think you'll draw much profit from this. He quotes St. John Damascene, who says, In the mystery of the Incarnation, the wisdom and power of God are made known. The wisdom, because he found the most fitting solution for the most difficult problem. What was the most difficult problem? How do how the fallen human race could possibly get to heaven. And how could their sins be remitted unless God took on flesh and shed his blood for them. There was no other way. There was other ways, but this was the best way, says St. Thomas. So, God found the most fitting solution for the most difficult problem that ever existed. How to redeem the human race. And then... He made, it shows his power, says St. John Damascene, for he made the conquered conquer. He made the conquered, the one crucified and died on the cross, conquer by his resurrection and ascension. And this is the Catholic faith. We adore our Lord Jesus Christ as God. And this is what separates us from all other false religions. We adore our Lord Jesus Christ as God. And we don't pick and choose what we want to believe. And we don't pick and choose the sacraments. And we don't pick and choose what Bible we're going to follow. And what books we're going to accept. We accept everything revealed by God. And that's the simplicity of, of, ch of children that we must have. So St. Thomas will then go to say, he has three proofs why it was most fitting that God the Son take on flesh for us. The first is an argument from on the part of the union. For such as are similar are fittingly united. Things that are similar are united fittingly. So when you're uh, harvest season, you put the apples with the apples, you put the oranges with the oranges, you put the peas with the peas, and the carrots with the carrots, right? You put everything together. For such as are similar are fittingly united. Now the person of the Son, who is the Word of God, has a certain common agreement with all creatures, because the Word of the craftsman, that is the idea of, of, an, of a craftsman, of, an, of a carpenter, is an exemplar likeness of whatever is made by him. So, a carpenter, when he builds, let's say, a cabinet, 
He has the idea of the cabinet in his head, what's it going to look like, the dimensions. And then he puts it into practice on paper, and then he builds it, right? So the exemplar, the, the concept of the mind, the blueprint in the mind of the, of the master craftsman is God the Son. In the Blessed Trinity, God the Son is the exemplar of all creation. And through Him everything was made. Hence, the Word of God who is His eternal concept, the exemplar likeness of all creatures. And therefore, as creatures are established in their proper species, though movably by the participation of those likeness, well, this gets a little bit philosophical, but to put it simply, to restore the ruined human race, it had to be the Son to restore it, since everything was made through Him. And this shows, when we, when we call and adore Christ as the wisdom of the Blessed Trinity, that means all wisdom, the details of the DNA, the DNA genetics shows, one thing it shows is that the whole human race comes from one father and one mother, Adam and Eve. Genetics has made this more clear. And then the, the detail of information in the genetics, the code will, la will, will for, most, for one cell will stretch from the moon and back. That's how much information is inside one DNA, one cell. And there's billions and billions of cells in, for example, the human body. So who constructed all this so wisely? It's the Divine Son. So with the human race fallen by sin, the most perfect one to repair it was to be the Son to repair it. God the Son, who is the wisdom of the Father. And then the other reason with this is that Christ, the, the Divine Son, the second person of the Trinity, He is called in Ecclesiasticus, the Word of God on high is the fountain of wisdom. So, the person of wisdom in the Blessed Trinity is God the Son. God the Father is the principle, God the Son is the Word uttered by the Father, and the Holy Ghost is the love that spirates from the Father and the Son. Now, I'm speaking about the Trinity, and we should be on our knees, even daring to speak of God is such a mystery, but we adore this mystery, and and we're going to see him face to face. So all the kids, you know, when you travel, when you travel, you look forward to just getting where you're going to. And our home is heaven, so we should love to hear about the Blessed Trinity, because that's going to be the supreme happiness of heaven is to see. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Three persons, but one God. So that's the first reason St. Thomas gives. Because God the Son is the exemplar. He's the, he's the blueprint, mental blueprint for all creation. So it's fitting that he repair it. And secondly, he is wisdom itself. And since man has a rational nature, it was fitting that man who misused his reason to believe the lies of the devil of Adam and Eve believed his lie it was fitting that he who was the verbum, the word of the father take on flesh the second reason St. Thomas gives the reason of this fitness may be taken from the end the end of this union which is the fulfilling of predestination that is of such as are preordained to the heavenly inheritance which is bestowed only on sons. According to Romans, St. Paul, if sons, heirs also. So what's he saying? He's, because those who are elected for heaven, those of us who will be in heaven, God willing, through His mercy. And God knows. Predestination is simply the teaching that God already knows who is going to go to heaven. He wants all men to be saved, but most, most men turn from him and spit at his commandments and throw themselves willingly to hell. Most men do. And narrow is the path to heaven. Few there are that find it because, quite honestly, few there are that really care to find it. Because to stay on the narrow path, it's tough, isn't it? 
the Ten Commandments, the daily prayer, the daily fighting against temptations of the devil, the flesh, the world. It's a daily battle. We all know this. So, um, what makes us children of God is, is to be sons of God. And since God the Son is the natural Son of the Father from all eternity, He had no beginning. God the Son generates from the Father, but there's no beginning of time. It's not like mother kitten gives birth to baby kittens and there's a beginning of time. There's a birthday. But Christ from eternity in His divine person has no beginning of time. There's no birthday. He's in principio, as the last gospel says. That means from eternity. Always was, always is. So, St. Thomas says, it, was, it is fitting that by Him who is the natural Son of the Father, men should share this likeness of sonship by adoption. As the Apostle says in the same chapter, For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be made conformable to the image of His Son. So that's our whole life, to be made conformed to our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our whole life. And it's not something at the end of the race you got to fight for and run for. You already possess Him. This is the beauty of the Catholic faith. You already possess the Blessed Trinity in your soul by sanctifying grace. So the work is more to be more and more united with the God who dwells in us and we in Him. And that's why the Benedictines, Dom de Lot, had a great love and, and veneration for the writings of a blessed um, Elizabeth of the Trinity, who dwelt, he was a Carmelite nun, who dwelt so much on this reality that so many Catholics will live and die not even realizing the treasure we always carry with us. The Blessed Trinity lives in us. So we, conf we transform all we do into an act of love of God. Everything turns to gold, for real. It's not just a story, for real. So the, the second reason why the Son should become man is because He was the Son. And we are made sons by adoption, by sanctifying grace. And it's the most terrible thing to lose this by mortal sin. And that's why when a soul dies in mortal sin, God the Blessed Trinity looks for the image of His divine Son. He doesn't see it. There's no sanctifying grace. There's no love for God. There's no true love of neighbor. And He has to say, depart from me because I don't know you. Because I don't see my Son in your soul. I don't see the reflection of the Father's and Holy Ghost in your soul, dwelling in your soul. And, the, and so those souls are, are burnt forever in hell. And hell is serious. Ooh, the sufferings are serious. Serious. Every revelation we have from about hell is frightening. The, su the greatest sufferings on earth is just carrots, shadows compared to the sufferings of hell. And that shows us the seriousness of God's love for us. Shows us also the gravity of sin. How serious sin really is. Which we, we forget because we're distracted by so many other things. Now the third reason. Why it was fitting for the Son to become flesh. And not the Father and the Holy Ghost. It was because of sin. The sin of our first parents. St. Thomas says this. The reason of this fittingness may be taken from the sin of our first parents, for which the Incarnation supplied the remedy. For the first man sinned by what? Seeking what? Seeking knowledge, as is plain from the words of the serpent, promising to Adam and Eve the knowledge of good and evil. And the, and the devil lied. He tied in there some truth, and he tied in there some lies. And he said, you won't die the death. You won't die. Hence, it was fitting that by the word of true knowledge, that is the verbum, the son of the, the son of the second person of the Trinity, the divine son, it was fitting that the son, who is true knowledge, might, man might be led back to God, having wandered away from God through an inordinate thirst for knowledge. So Christ will not only 
teach us the way. He really is the way. He is the truth. He is our life. And that's tremendous. And He lives in us by grace. No, we, we must never forget this treasure. To live in the Blessed Trinity by grace. He is the way, the truth, the life. And the way by the, all the doctrines of the Catholic faith. He is the truth because He comes from the Blessed Trinity. He is the second person of the Trinity. And He's the life because the real life is the sanctifying grace. If we don't have sanctifying grace, we're walking cadavers. Did you know that? Walking cadavers. Hollywood's now big about zombies, dead bodies walking around. But it's really true with people living in mortal sin. If your soul is dead, you're a walking zombie. Your soul is, you're a walking casket. A dead body with a dead, a living body with a dead soul. It's spooky, and it should be, because we're not supposed to be living in mortal sin. That's not how God made us, and it's completely unnatural. It goes against the very purpose of God creating man. So to live in the state of grace is what we're made for. And that, when we die, that state of grace will be transformed to vision of the Blessed Trinity. Even if, even if souls have to be purged in purgatory for some time. So those are the three great reasons from St. Thomas. Because Christ is the exemplar, He's the blueprint for all creation, so He has to repair it. Secondly, He's the wisdom of the Father, and since we're made by reason, He will, he will show us and be the way for us. And then uh, He is the Son of the Eternal Father, so He should be the Son to adopt us into the Blessed Trinity by buying us with His precious blood. And then lastly, the Adam and Eve thirsting, seeking inordinate knowledge by pride. Christ showed them the true knowledge. And this is eternal life, to know Jesus Christ, and, and to, know, to, to know Thee, Father, and to know Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. And we know Him, as the Catechist, as, as St. Thomas says, we don't just know the knowledge he's talking about is not just knowing the definitions of our catechism. Any atheist can do that. But when he speaks of knowledge of God, that means to really know the Blessed Trinity by living in grace. That's to know God, to live in His grace. That's to love God, to live in the sanctifying grace. That's to hope in the vision of the Trinity and the happiness of heaven is to already be in heaven now on earth. By saying divine grace. The only difference is vision. That's the only difference. What a treasure we possess in vessels of clay, as St. Paul says. So let's answer. Let's see what St. Thomas says about the objections. The first objection we saw was, it should be God the Father who takes on flesh. Then there will be no confusion with Arian heresy. So what does St. Thomas say? He says... Listen to this. This is very true. <laughs> there is nothing which human malice cannot abuse, since it even abuses God's goodness. According to Romans 2, when St. Paul says, Or do you despise the riches of His goodness? Despise God's riches? And so St. Thomas says the richest thing that we could have is that God became man. So if the Father did become man, that would also be attacked by certain malicious men. Heresies would attack that also, says St. Thomas. So it, even the incarnation is attacked. So that's why when you keep the Catholic faith and you hold fast to tradition and you're attacked for it, rejoice. Because even if God the Father became man, or God the Holy Ghost became, they would still attack Him. And of course they attacked that God the Son became man. Alright, and then the, the last of the objection was, why not the Holy Ghost become man? Since the Incarnation is ordained for the remission of sins, and St. Matthew says, Thou shalt call His name Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sins. So that's why God became man, right? 
to wash away sin. Now, the remission of sins is attributed to the Holy Ghost. As our Lord said at the resurrection, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them, speaking to the apostles. Therefore, it is, it is, it is more fitting that the person of the Holy Ghost, rather than the person of the Son, should become flesh for us. You follow? Since all sin is remitted by the Holy Ghost, it should be the Holy Ghost, since that was the purpose of becoming man. So here's what St. Thomas says. To be the gift, the donum in Latin, donum, to be the gift of the Father and the Son is proper to the Holy Ghost. But the remission of sins is caused by the Holy Ghost as by the gift of God. And hence it was most fitting to man's justification that the Son should become incarnate, who, who with the Father would give the gift of the Holy Ghost. With the Father, the Son gives the gift of the Holy Ghost to us. And all three persons dwell in us by sin divine grace. And that's what washes away sin at our baptism. And that's why if we trip up into fallen mortal sin, St. Jerome speaks of the second plank after shipwreck, which is confession. And the most miraculous thing, the most tremendous thing takes place in confession. A soul that was dead comes back to life. A soul that was a child of hell becomes again a child of God. And this is the beauty of the, the great love of the Sacred Heart, that the sacraments pour out His precious blood and all His grace and all His divine love. So that's, in a nutshell, a little glimpse of St. Thomas, why it was fitting that the Son should become man for us and not the Father and the Holy Ghost because of the reasons I just gave. And one of the big ones is the adoption of sons. We are truly adopted as children of God by sanctifying grace. So we have to value this, value this so much. And this is what's so severely attacked. And a lot of people forget this. When, uh, when Archbishop Lefebvre and all the popes before Vatican II and all the priests of trying to keep tradition especially of the resistance. Um, when they condemn Vatican II, it's not just a political thing. Vatican II attacks our Lord Jesus Christ. Vatican II attacks the Blessed Trinity. It attacks the sacraments. It attacks the very life, the life of your soul. Because the new Mass makes you lose your faith. That's why you don't go to it. And that's why I'm... So it's regretful. It's very regretful that Bishop Williamson has made these statements about going to the new Mass, that it gives grace, and you can go to it if it nourishes your faith. He knows better than that. And he has to publicly reject this. He has to publicly condemn his, his errors. I hope he does before he dies. These are big errors, huge errors. Because if you start listening to that, and you start going to the new Mass, you're going to start losing your faith, and you might end up in the fires of hell for all eternity. It's not a joke and it's not a game. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre didn't play games. He understood this is, this is the real fight. And to save your soul, you don't go to the new Mass. You don't go to compromised Masses. You don't go to Sede Masses either. Archbishop Lefebvre was clear about all this. So the fight for our, of our resistance... It's not about attacking Bishop so-and-so and Bishop so-and-so, and not about having our own seminary in our group. Far from it. Father Pfeiffer and I, and I never dreamt <laughs> in our life of running a seminary or ever teaching at one. We just never dreamt this ever. We'd, but no one else is doing it, so we, we have to do it. Because that's the mind of the church, to form priests for tomorrow. And we trust in God that He will... He will convert one of these bishops to wake them up. To wake them up. To realize they have to hold the line of Archbishop Lefebvre. There is no other, there is no other, no other position that, hold, that is in line with all of tradition and all the popes of tradition. So it's so important that you realize, especially you younger people, you children, who didn't grow up fighting for the faith like your grandparents. 
It's very important. You realize this is not about some documents and a bunch of paper and a bunch of definition. It's about going to heaven or hell. It's about the honor of our Lord Jesus Christ as God, as King, as eternal high priest, as the only Savior. And for example, ecumenism attacks him and says there's other saviors. Buddha can be a savior. Muhammad can be a savior. And uh, distorted, per perverted twistings of the Bible, which the Protestants make in so many thousands of de denominations. There, there's no Holy Ghost there. There's no Holy Ghost in false churches. The gods of the Gentiles are devils. And that's why with Pope Francis praying with the Lutherans, and next year he's going to have another huge ecumenical... It's an insult to God. It draws down God's anger. His anger. And His anger is a terrible thing to see, to witness. Look what happened to the wife of Lot. God told them, don't look back, you will, because my wrath will be unleashed on Sodom and Gomorrah. And the curious wife turned and looked. She turned to a pillar of salt. And archaeologists have a good guess that there is in the desert, not far from Sodom and Gomorrah, there stands this pillar all on its own. And they make a pretty good educated guess that's probably Lot's wife, still standing there. A little eroded from weather, but it's, she's still standing there. So the lesson is, we don't want to see God's wrath. And in hell it's unleashed. And even the Virgin Mary, even... St. John Eude says, even in hell, it's not the full-blown punishment that is fully deserved, and it's still so horrible. So, dear faithful, understand the fight for the faith that God put us in, that we love our Lord Jesus Christ, we fight for Him, we are members of His church militant, and we got to fight till our death, and learn from the enemies of Christ. <laughs> And learn from the, the military men how, how devoted they are. They give everything for their cause. Even the communists give everything for their cause. And the Satanists, they totally give themselves to the devil. And they really do evil. And they really try to work for the devil. And we who are the soldiers of Christ the King, we must give everything for Him. In whatever state of life you're in. Let me close with uh, great words of St. Germanus, Archbishop of Constantinople, who is speaking to the Virgin Mary. And she, we, we know she's our whole, only hope in this mess. And we really are. You know, Rome wants Catholic tradition not assimilated. Modernist Rome wants Catholic tradition exterminated off the face of the earth. That's why there can be no agreement or peace. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre was right. You don't seek agreements with these monsters of heresy who are destroying our church, even if they're dressed in white or purple. And Pope Francis, we know, is a bad pope. I don't need to convince you of that. He just came out with six new Beatitudes. The sixth Beatitude is, uh, Blessed are the Christians who seek Christian unity of all religions. Total blasphemy. Total blasphemy. So, we we got to realize Rome wants, modernist Rome, the modernists, want the Catholic faith extinguished. And Pope Francis has a great disgust for tradition, for rosaries, for everything of the Latin Mass. He, he despises it. He tore up the Franciscans of the Immaculate. They no longer exist. He just completely bombed them. And these good priests and nuns who were Navasoto going to our tradition, pray for them. And pray for our Pope too. Because he's, he'll have a, he's going to have a tremendous amount to answer for. So let me close with these great words of St. Germanus. Who does not admire thee, O Virgin Mother? Who does not love thee, O most generous Virgin? Thou art our firm hope, our sure protection, our unshakable refuge. Thou art our most vigilant guardian, our perpetual safeguard, our most powerful help, our strongest defense, our unconquerable tower. Thou art, O Mary, the treasure of our joy, the garden of our delight, 
our impregnable fortress, our inaccessible bulwark. Thou art, O Mary, the port of those who are in danger of shipwreck, the security of sinners, the asylum of the abandoned. Thou art the reconciliation of criminals, the salvation of the lost, the blessing of the accursed. Thou art, O Mary, the general and public purveyor of every kind of blessing. In short, who could ever comprehend the effects of thy mercy? O heaven, O queen of heaven, blessed be thou amongst all generations. There is no place in the world where thy praises are not sung, and there is no race or tribe from which God does not receive some tribute and service through thy mediation. So the Blessed Mother, we can never praise her enough. So honor her every day with the rosary. Keep fighting. And I know you get Mass rarely, but it's good to see this little flock of Calgary holding strong. And uh, seek to bring others in. Seek to bring others, convert souls to the heart of our Lord and Our Lady. That's what they want. To the true Catholic faith for which we're fighting and will be found faithful through Our Lady's help. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. <coughs>